Welcome into episode 193 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Scott McLaughlin. Bridget is not with us this morning. It's not from a lack of trying. She was had audio issues and router issues and every reason under the sun that was just going against her. And she really wishes she could be on this, but it just it wasn't in the cards today, unfortunately. Hard hard to do a podcast with with audio issues. <laughs> yeah, some would say. Pretty, some would say. Pretty, pretty important part of the equation. Yeah. So we will certainly get uh, all of her opinions on on what happened last night when we speak again later this week on the podcast, probably after breakup day. And it will be breakup day because, yes, the Boston Bruins lost game seven after the best regular season in the league's history. The Boston Bruins lost in the first round to the Florida Panthers. And, Scott, there are a million and one reasons as to why the Bruins lost this series, things they did do, things they didn't do. And we're going to break it all down 100%. But Florida showed – some serious, serious resilience in this series. They, they, their backs were against the wall three to one. They were facing elimination in game five in overtime. They were shot away from their season ending. Twice in game six, they had to come back in the third period to, to tie the Bruins and eventually go ahead. And then in game seven, after being up to nothing, the Bruins storm back, take a three two lead, probably pretty easy for a team to be deflated. But not this Florida team. They come back with 59 seconds left, and Montour scores a second of the game. They win in overtime. It it just seemed to me, Scott. And so Florida deserves every everything. They deserve all the accolades in the world. They deserve all the credit in the world. Boston deserves every criticism coming their way. But it it really looked like a team that was playing for their lives the last couple of months versus a team that just didn't know how to gear up for what was ahead in the playoffs it's just when you when you play so well all year you don't have much to play for at the end I mean it was pretty glaring to me yeah I I don't I can't let the Bruins off the hook with with that excuse though of of uh, you know they just weren't playing important enough hockey like I I said at the time and, and I said it last episode that we did I think they got and should have gotten that out of their system after game two it even you know, game one, they didn't play their best. They didn't quite match the intensity, but they win. Game two, they get run off their home ice. Like, to me, that was the wake-up call. And then I thought you saw the Bruins play a lot better in games three and four and control those games for long stretches. Even game five, they they were in control for good chunks of that game. Just made some really awful turnovers, which became a theme of the series, obviously. Um Game seven, they had 18 giveaways. You know, Florida's second goal, Garnet Hathaway and Hampus Lindholm both have failed clearances. You know, just weakly throwing pucks up the boards that get kept in the zone. So I thought the Bruins did wake up and did rise to the challenge and start playing playoff hockey. And then I think it just got away from them for, for other reasons, which the turnovers being the main one, goaltending, letting them down, being another too many lineup changes, some ne- ne- some necessitated by injuries and, and guys leaving the lineup, returning to the lineup and some unnecessary with Jim Montgomery. I think overthinking things in terms of, you know, starting game five with Bergeron and Martian and different lines, taking Grizzly out when he had been playing pretty well. Um, you know, the, Bertuzzi debrusque switch in in game seven. I I get why he did that because I'm sure he probably looked at a Hall Coil Bertuzzi third line and thought that's not really defensively what I want from a third line, especially on the wings. And debrusque might bring a little more, but as a result, I think you end up with the first and third line that were pretty quiet. And it's like I don't know. At some point, you probably need to figure out that third line. We talked about how it was. Weird that, you know, Hall, Coyle, Bertuzzi like, never got a chance together in the regular season, even when there were opportunities after Hall returned. And because of that, you end up breaking up your top line and taking DeBrusque off of the line with Bergeron and Marsh. And um, so just a lot of stuff went into it, but I'm, I, I can't let them off the hook with the, you know, they, they weren't playing playoff hockey. They weren't as desperate as the Panthers. Like, they got there, and at 
look, at the very least, they should have been pretty damn desperate in game seven. And I thought once they fell behind two, nothing, they were like, you saw them come alive and you saw that Bruins team that we saw all season that refuses to roll over that has comebacks in them that can start scoring goals in quick succession and they get a three, two lead. And then for the third time in the last two games of the series, they blow a third period lead. Um, you know, they, they kind of got really defensive late in that third period. And it was sort of hang on for dear life, which in pulled goalie situations, sometimes that, you know, is, is going to happen. But again, there were some failed clearances there. The goal itself ends up being, you know, a little bit of bad luck where they actually get the shot block and it just goes right to Montour and he has a little bit of a screen to work with. Um, but then in overtime, they, you know, they got outplayed, had the early chance to David Postenak 30 seconds into overtime. Beats Bobrovsky over the blocker and it hits the knob of B- of Bobrovsky's stick. Like game of inches, game of seconds, you know, close on several occasions. Martians break away right at the end of game five. Um, but just not quite enough. They come up, they come up one goal short. And whether that's, you know, you can look at the offensive end finishing, missing a couple great chances. And you're going to get goaltending needing one more save, which really for the last three games of the series, it certainly in games five and six, they didn't get that extra save from Linus Elmark. Swayman early on gives up a goal. He probably should have stopped to Montour the, the backhander through the five hole. Um, does stop two point blank chances in overtime. So like, I, I'm not going to, Fault him in overtime. He did his part. He bailed his team out twice and gave them a chance to win, and they didn't. Yeah, I, the the story for me is that, like, usually when a team when a team loses, when the Bruins lose, there's there's like a a feeling in your stomach of, well, the refs called a penalty here, and then the other team scored, and you kind of pin it on that, or just like just random things but in this series like aside from the fact that it's the biggest objectively it could be the biggest collapse in the in the league's history right i oddly woke up this morning at peace because i think that the the panthers deserve to win this series and and that speaks volumes to the bruins of course and it's a it's a massive insult to to how they performed in the series but the better the better team over the over the course of seven games won, in my opinion. Even in game one, when the Bruins won the game and took a lead in the series, like it wasn't a it was not a good game, but for the Bruins, they lose game two. Then they go on the road without Bergeron and Krejci, win games three and four, and then Scott, who would have ever thought you get Patrice Bergeron back in the lineup and you lose all three games consecutively? That is that blows my mind. It really does. So much about this series blows my mind. But at the end of the day, the Panthers kept their game more simple than the Bruins. They they outworked them for the majority of the series. They outcoached them and they out executed them. And the reason they out executed them was because the Bruins kept overthinking every step of the way, both on the bench, behind the bench, and on the ice. And to me, there's not one excuse for this Boston Bruins team losing other than the fact that the other team deserved to win and the Bruins got outplayed. And what's what's crazy is that offensively, the Bruins were fine. I mean, you I was saying this, I think I was saying this to you before we, we started recording, but you can't really look at one player on the Bruins who's a scorer and say that they didn't show up in the series. Brad Marchand had, what, 10, 11 points? Taylor Hall, eight points or so. Pasternak was quiet through five games, but of course had three goals in game six and seven and picked his game back up. Bertuzzi was lights out. Bergeron was okay when he came back offensively. Not great, right? But it was the story for me is it's defense, defense and goaltending. Their structure was terrible. There, I, I mean, you've said it so many times, so I don't want to repeat it, but the turnovers, the giving the puck away, the careless play with with the puck on their stick, not getting timely saves when they needed them, and 
the team wide board play, the Bruins lost all series. Florida was better on the boards. They were better on the four check and they were better on the breakout. And what do you what do you what do you what do you blame that on? Do you blame that on X's and O's? Do you blame that on on the guys just not executing? Like what what's the what's the what's the reason for losing the board battles so much, Scott? Yeah, well, you know, for starters, the Panthers were one of the best four check and cycle teams in the NHL all season. And for much of the season, it wasn't translating to huge offensive numbers, but eventually it did down the stretch. It, it caught up and that they absolutely, they make their living. And it's the biggest change from last year's Panthers team, which was heavily relying on the rush. And when you, you know, you trade out a Huberto for a Kachuk, like, that's obviously the biggest shift, but just team wide, Paul Maurice got this team to be a great four checking team. Um, you know, and the the Bruins this season, like if you dig into you know the advanced stats and all that, like weren't weren't a great four checking team. They were great in a lot of areas. That's one that they weren't. Um, obviously, they tried to address that at the trade deadline, bringing in Bertuzzi and Hathaway, and I think it it helped to an extent. And but the thing is, is like you, you don't necessarily have to be the better forechecking team to to win the series. Like there was still enough else there in the recipe for the Bruins to win. And um, you know, Florida's forecheck was going to force some turnovers, and some of them were going to end up in the back of the net. Like that 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 that's going to happen when you're facing a great forechecking team. Um, what really bothers me though is the turnovers that were committed not under stress that where they really weren't under pressure and they still just gave the puck away. I mean, Bertuzzi's backhand in, into the slot, he, he had time. Like, like, yeah, it's not like he had all the time in the world, but there wasn't someone right on top of him and he turns it over. Clifton's two turnovers in game six had time one of them there was no one around him and he just makes a terrible pass through the neutral zone he had he had somebody on his right hand side scott for for swinging like he, he had a he had a wide open teammate up going up the right wing boards on that turnover he went up the middle with i mean yeah it, it was the opposite of he had he had somebody yeah it, it, brutal and the the second goal in game seven that i mentioned hathaway just has a basic chip just chip it up off the glass like pretty basic play and instead he tries like a weak one-handed poke check that stays in the zone and it's like buddy like it's game seven of the stanley cup playoffs like you can't be one-handing pucks out of the zone and expect that to work hampus lindholm off the boards had some pressure on him but it wasn't like he was about to take a huge hit like he, he had some time and he just made a bad play um th- so that stuff it's like you could have survived Florida's four check. You could have dealt with some errors caused by that and still won the series. If you just cleaned up the unforced ones, like, and then the other part of the equation that should have been a huge plus in the Bruins favor and was all season was goaltending. And it wasn't that, you know, Bruins on the series with an eight eighty five save percentage. I mean, that's just horrible. The Panthers in the totality of the series wound up winning the goaltending battle. That is stunning. That is not something I would have predicted. The Panthers were a below average team in, in goaltending in the regular season. The only time they got really good goaltending in the regular season was Alex Lyon getting hot down the stretch. And you actually knocked him out of the series. You forced them to go to Bobrovsky. And credit to Bobrovsky, he played well and in two of the three games he started, I think he was shaky in game six, but Allmark was even more shaky in games five and six. And Swayman gives up at least one. He probably wants back in game seven and we can get into the whole, you know, was it a mistake not to play him earlier? Was it even a mistake to play him in game seven? I'll, you know, does he give up that first goal because he's rusty? Like, I don't know, but it, the, the areas where the Bruins should have had advantages they didn't. So in the area where the Panthers should have had an advantage, the four check, you know, that shows up as a deciding factor because that's where you notice the Panthers biggest edge and the areas where the Bruins should have had an edge. They didn't. And in my opinion, that was 
that was really self-inflicted. They should have been able to overcome Florida being a great forechecking team if they just did other things that they had done all season but did not do in the series. Yeah, and look, you can you can over over analyze that first goal, swim and let up, and maybe ask the question: Was it because was that, is that a goal he'd give up if he wasn't on the bench for a few weeks? But at the end of the day, he was he was really good after that, and his team had a three two lead with a minute left in the game. And the the last goal, or I should say, the last goal in regulation to tie the game, it seemed a little leaky, but. In a six on five situation, you got a lot of stuff going on in front of the net, and I don't—I I would be surprised if anybody were to, were to watch that and really blame him for that either. So, you know, it's it's one of those series where you, you, you look at it in hindsight and you 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 match you match up going into a series. All right, who who has the edge in coaching? Who has the edge in offense? Who has the edge in defense? Who actually has the edge in net and special teams? Who has the best player in the series potentially? Right. Florida ended up checking off a lot of those boxes at the end of the series that Boston would have checked off in the beginning of the series. And you can start with the coaching. I mean, Jim Montgomery is the lead horse for, uh, was it the Jack Adams? Yep. And Paul Maurice outcoached him. I mean, I would argue Jim Montgomery outcoached himself because he just overthought everything. But Paul Maurice outcoached him. And I think Paul Maurice just really galvanized his team. I mean, to go down three to one, that's a daunting task. The Bruins, I mean, it's insane. It's insane. Um, Allmark is still, despite his playoff performance, based on the regular season, probably going to win the, the Vesna Trophy. And we all know he he did not out-goal tend really anybody in the series. And Matt Kachuk was probably the best forward in the series. And who would have thought? But, but that's not that crazy. Like, like you know. Yes, Pashnak had 62 goals and 110 points, but Matthew Kachuk was right up there too with him in points. And yeah. He's a, he's an all-world player. Nobody would have batted an eye at, at Matthew Kachuk, especially at his playing style, um, translating to the, to the postseason. But at the end of this series, to sit there and say that Charlie McAvoy wasn't the best defenseman in the series, Hampus Lindholm wasn't the best defenseman in the series, hell, even Dimitri Orloff wasn't the best defenseman in the series. It was Brandon Montour. And that is something that, and and Brandon Montour going to the series, like we talked about him, like I, he was my player to watch. Was Brandon Montour? He had like seventy something points. Great player, great defenseman, especially especially offensively. Defensively, I feel like he's, you know, decent enough. But it it was it was the offense that came through. How many goals did he have in this series? Seven, six, six goals as and, and two multi goal games one of them being in game seven and the goals that he scored to do it. So it, yeah, it, there's, there's so there's so many reasons why this series played out the way that it did. And Brandon Montour being the best defenseman in the series is certainly up there. Yeah. My, Mont- Montour had five goals, three assists. And yeah, like we, we had talked about, you know, I thought, look, Brandon Montour is a great offensive defenseman. Like he had, you know, he had over 70 points this year. Um, and he was out there for some goals again, so it's not like the Bruins, you know, like completely missed out on exposing him defensively. But I did feel like they they could have done it more. Like we talked about, you know, what's the best way to limit his offense? Pin him in his own zone. Like like attack him, go after him. He's not very good defensively. I thought at times they did that, but not but not enough. Um. And, you know, he, he had too many chances offensively. And, like, uh, you know, I'm sure we could go back on video and see, you know, did forwards lose him in coverage? Like, uh, did they have the right matchups? Do they need, you know, a better defensive left wing out there against them at time? Like, you know, I don't know. But, yeah, for they didn't pin him in his in his own zone enough for, for my liking um, and, and attack him that way. And that – Freeze him up. If he doesn't have to do as much work defensively, he's he's gonna do work offensively. He's gonna be very involved, and he was all series, and especially on the power play, you know, he was a weapon there. And um, you know, the Bruins penalty kill, like other parts of their game, sort of broke down as the series went on. You know, started really strong, killed off Florida's first nine power plays, and then 
you know, Florida's able to break through on the power play uh, the last few games. So, um, yeah, just just again, like a, a lot of things that the Bruins should have been able to better take advantage of, uh, and and weren't. It, it is crazy. Like we we talked about how much better going in the Bruins decor was is than the Panthers. Like that Panthers decor, it's like man, there's just not much there that's special. Like Montour's offense, yes. Aaron Eckblad has had a great career, had, had a down year this year. And I, I didn't even really think he was great in the series. He had moments. He missed time with injury. Like, But I don't think Aaron Eckblad was a huge difference maker. So it, it's just it's amazing like they weren't able to to better expose that decor in, in their own zone, like with possession and cycling and keep the puck away from them. Um, you know, at times they did that, like I said, game five, coming back like they had a lot of possession but game six they got pretty badly outplayed at five on five um you know so it's tough and to your point about the bruins decor like didn't think we saw charlie mcavoy's best for much of this series orlov had some great moments with you know eight assists like that's you know, look, can't take that away from him. Like, that's impressive. And, and a lot of them were primary assists. Um, but he also got hurt defensively at times and, and had some bad plays in his own zone. Um, you know, that Orlov McAvoy pairing, Montgomery went to it a lot and it, it didn't always work. Like, they never quite looked as connected as you would want two defensemen of that caliber to look. Um, you know, Lindholm, Carlo, like I, I thought Brandon Carlo had a great series. Like, I guess if you're looking for, for, for silver linings, like there's a guy, you know, who's had postseason question marks in the past. And I thought it really stepped up. Um, and because of that, the Lindholm, Carlo pairing overall was, was a plus, but you definitely wanted more from Lindholm. Like, you know, just until game seven, almost no offensive involvement from him. I thought, in game seven, you saw him jump into the offense more. He had some nice offensive zone cycle shifts um, with McAvoy in particular, which kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, should they have maybe gone to that earlier at, at times and, you know, throw a Lindholm McAvoy out there for more offensive zone shifts. And again, another easy second guess, but um, yeah. And then, you know, it, it's funny, like you, you've been ha- talking about Lindholm all series needing more from him. And I kind of poo pooed. And so like, you know, not pretty far down the list of my concerns, but then he has one of those brutal turnovers that leads to a goal against in game seven. So it's like, yeah, you know, really hard to ignore it now. Like that kind of capped off a very disappointing series for him. Yeah. You know, what else doesn't really get captured in the analytics of everything when you, when watching him like last night in particular, especially in the first period, every time he touched the puck, and he was down, and he was down in the, in the Bruins D zone. And even if the even if he was regrouping, even if there wasn't even anybody on him, he looked like he was skating on a half frozen pond where like it was just melted, and he kept toe picking and toe picking, and he looked like Bambi. This is a guy who a lot of people thought should win the Norris Trophy, and and he's he's acting like he doesn't he can't skate, and skating is one of his strongest attributes. So, and and last year against Carolina. I and it's tough to really critique him because I still think he was probably playing half concussed after the Shvetchnikov hit. But I didn't, I didn't think he was great in the postseason last year. I thought I didn't think McAvoy was great in the postseason last year. And those guys, you can't be top five, top ten defenseman in the regular season, and then only be that guy for sixty percent of a series in McAvoy's case or not at all in Lindholm's case in this series. So I don't know. Like, do I not want Lindholm on the Boston Bruins going forward? Of course they want him on the team, but I definitely have some question marks about if he's a playoff type player. And that's fair to say at this point, I've watched him for yeah. two post seasons and his play has decreased and de-elevated each post season from the post, from the regular season. And that's, that's, that's a totally fair criticism to have after 14 games of watching him now with the Bruins in the postseason. Yeah. And he, He's 
so like including obviously the games he missed last year. He's now played eleven playoff games as a yeah, Bruin. Right. He missed a couple and, games, right? And and has zero points. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and in the regular and, season, he's driving offense. Yeah, he had top fifty points this year. Like, and I know it's not, you know, he's not Eric Carlson. It's not his primary job, right? Like, you, you want him to take care of his own zone first. That's his strength, but you expect some offense like that. That is part of what he brings. And that's, that's what makes him elite when he's playing at an elite level. Like the, you know, the defensive stuff, it's like, yeah, you can find guys who can play solid defense. It's that two way game that should make Hampus Lindholm elite. And we just haven't seen it in the playoffs. It's been, it's been, been very much a, a one way game. And then when that one way game includes, a terrible turnover in game seven that leads to a goal. It's like, all right, well that, you know, like that one mistake sort of negates everything else because you didn't do anything offensively to make up for it. Like, you know, if he had, mm-hmm. if he had seven points in the series and had committed that turnover, you'd be like, well, okay, but he still contributed more offensively. Like maybe you can kind of excuse one, one bad defensive mistake, but when, when there's no offense there and then the turnover happens, it's like, okay, well, you know, that's, that's it. Like, that's what you're going to remember because you don't, you don't have any offensive moments for him to remember this series. There was no, no pinching into the slot and beating the goalie. There's no stretch pass. Like the ones Orlov made no cycling behind the net and feeding someone in the slot. Like didn't happen. We started in the regular season. Wasn't there this series. Yeah, and you saw and you saw Brad Martian pissed off at Lindholm in game seven because he tries to move the puck from the corner to the to the uh I think it was to the either the point on the boards, hugging the boards or towards the middle. But whichever way Martian went with the puck, it was to nobody. And it's because Lindholm didn't didn't move along the blue line where he was supposed to. And this is not this is not uh March of 2022 when Hampus Lindholm just joined the Boston Bruins as is still learning their system. Like this is game seven. You've been here for a year and a half and it's game seven of your second year with the Bruins. You should know where you should be when Marcia gets the puck in a certain position on, on the boards in the offensive zone. So at the end of the day, you're, you cannot, your best players have to be your best players in the postseason If you want to achieve your ultimate goal, there's no way around it. Like the, what's interesting is if the Bruins found a way to hold on to that lead at the end of the third period and, or win in overtime, I felt that they would have dodged a massive bullet and that they would have been able to have a massive exhale because in this first round series, I do think that the pressure of being the greatest regular season team of all time and losing in the first round was looming over them. I don't think they would have felt as much pressure in the second round or the third round or the cup finals, but there's something about being that team and playing in the first round and potentially losing that they were playing scared and they were playing timid and tight. And if the Bruins found a way to somehow win their way to a series through mediocre play by their standards and get through the, through the second round, I thought that they would calm down as a group. And I thought that they would tighten up in a good way defensively and that their best players would have more opportunity to be their best players. But guess what? It's the playoffs. It's a best of seven. And the first round counts as much as the fourth round. And if your best players aren't your best players in the first round, you can go home. And in my opinion, David Pasternak was David Pasternak in game six and seven. He wasn't your best player in the first five games. Brad Marchand is one of your best players. I thought he was one of your best players all series long. Charlie McAvoy, Hampus Lindholm, they're supposed to be your best players in the back end. They they weren't themselves. So you can categorize it how you want, but they they didn't bring you what they bring in regular season, at least consistently enough. And then you had other Bergeron. Look, the guy the guy was playing hurt with a herniated disc in his back, but in the games that he played, he was certainly good, but he wasn't himself all around the ice. He was trying, he just wasn't effective. Krejci, goal in game seven, what you know, whatever. Like the Bruins, if it wasn't for Tyler Bertuzzi and Taylor Hall having a combined close to twenty points, then who knows where this series would have would have ended. I mean, I don't know. So they're Ultimately, at the end of the day, enough of the Bruins' best players weren't their best players consistently enough, and I think that Florida's best players were their best players consistently enough. Matthew Kachuk, Brendan Montour, 
Barkov, not so much. It's weird to me that the Panthers won this game or won this series in seven games after being down three to one without Barkov having something in around five goals and seven assists or something like that. Like he, he only had seven, seven points in six games or six points in seven games. I think it was six points in seven games, which isn't terrible, but Barkov is certainly capable of more than production than that. Yeah. And since you mentioned Bergeron and, and Krejci, like definitely worth getting into them because like you said, they Bergeron misses the first four games. They're up three to one. He comes back and they lose all three games that he plays. And they lose game six and seven with him and Krejci in the lineup. And it's fascinating with Bergeron because, as you said, like we we he told us after the game that uh, that he has a herniated disc in his back. That as much as we can say, like you know, how they survive the first round, they take a you know sigh of relief and and move on. That would have lingered. That would have been a question mark. Like, how effective would he have been? How much would he have dealt with that? Because I'm no, I'm no doctor, but I don't think playing playoff hockey makes a herniated disc better. Um, I think you're you would just be crossing your fingers and praying that it doesn't get significantly worse. Um, but you know, it, like some of his, some of the stuff you would look at and say, okay, that kind of looks like Bergeron. He won 70% of his face-offs. You would think, you know, a back injury, maybe that affects face-offs. Really didn't. Uh, led the team in Corsi. That's classic Bergeron. Uh, played over, played 19.30 per game, so, like, ice time wasn't way down. But yet, when he was on the ice at 5-on-5, five five, the Bruins got outscored 4 nothing. He had one point, a power play goal. Like, that's not Bergeron. Um, and it's like, you know, those goals against... While I don't think anywhere directly his fault, was he maybe half a step slow and, you know, a, a transition gets started that he might normally get a stick on or he's a half a step behind the guy in the back check. Like, the, he's he's out there for the Game 7 winner, and it's, it's really a two-on-three battle behind the net. Kachuk and Bennett and Carlo Bergeron and Grizzly are all there. And there's some lucky bounces going on. No one's... No one really gets control until it eventually comes to Bennett, but that you know, that's a play where it's like when Ber- if Bergeron's there, you just expect that he's going to be the one to win it. He's going to be the one to get the stick in the right spot, and instead the Bruins lose that battle, and then it gets gets over Haggy, and he wins wins the series. Um, so I think you do wonder like was he just a little off, and that you know. Therefore, you you don't have Bergeron as best, which means you don't have that line at its best, which means, you know, like I talked about, I didn't love taking DeBrusque off, but it's like, even if DeBrusque stays, does Marshan Bergeron DeBrusque look the way it usually looks if if Bergeron's struggling a little? Um, you know, Krejci, Krejci shows up for game seven, no question about it. Goal and two assists, and I thought that that line was good. Other than that, in the series, in the three game, the other three games that Krejci played, he had one point, and the Bruins basically got doubled up in shots when he was on the ice. Games one and two, especially, he was bad, and I thought game six he was he was okay getting back in, and game seven he was good. But you know, it, it's definitely fair to say like you played this series without Bergeron and Krejci at their best, and and obviously they both missed time. But even when they were in there, like. That's an, that's another big factor. You know, those guys were a big part of this team's success this year because they both came back, and while they maybe didn't play exactly like they did in their prime, they they had good seasons. You know, Krejci was productive. Bergeron's going to win another Selkie. Um, but a Bergeron who's on the ice for four goals against in three games – that's that's not Selkie Bergeron. Like that's not what we usually are, expect to see. And you know, playoff Kretsch didn't show up to Game Seven. That's a good time to show up, but is the series over earlier than that? If if he's able to to bring that in, you know, earlier in the series or in Game Six when he returns. So, you know, that's I guess you could say like that's the risk in in having so much 
be relying on two older centers. It's it's a tough position to be old at in the NHL. But I don't know. You know, Bergeron called the play where he got injured a fluke play. So it wasn't, you know, we still don't even really know exactly what play it was, but it sounds like it wasn't like a, it wasn't a bad hit. It wasn't a super physical play. It's Montgomery had alluded to like last week that it was something that could have happened at, at home. So that leads me to believe like it was like, he just tweaked it, turned the wrong way or something. And, um, you know, so it's like, did that happen because he's, older and he was wearing down late in the season or was it really just a freak accident? And we don't know exactly what Krejci was dealing with. We didn't uh, get a chance to talk to him after game seven. He wasn't available, which, which is fine. Like I don't, I don't fault guys. who don't want to talk after a game like that, especially if you're Krejci and it's, you know, decent chance it's your last game. Um, but obviously he was dealing with something as well. And it's, it's the same thing. It's like, is that just because he's, He's older, and that's almost bound to happen at the end of a long season. You know, who knows? But ultimately, like, those guys weren't themselves in the series, and, and that hurts. It does hurt. And and there's a couple of th- directions I want to go with based off of those comments. But when you, when you say that Bergeron hurt his back on a fluke play, I, I hear that, and all that illustrates to me is just how easy – it is to get hurt in the National Hockey League and how and how pretty much inevitable it is over the course of an 82-game season and a postseason that something's going to happen because even if it's not something over the course of play like getting getting trucked by a good hit or blocking a shot with your, with your knee or your ankle or breaking a wrist or a hand blocking a shot or getting hit the wrong way, if it's none of those things that are hurting you, you could just pull something. And to your point, yeah, the older you get, that's going to happen. Look, I love Patrice Bergeron. He is, he is, he's my my favorite Bruin in my lifetime, and and I have so much respect for him. And, and that guy will play through absolutely anything. There's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of chatter about his future in the media amongst fans in the locker room and probably at his house over the next few months. And if he decides to come back, do I think the Bruins are a worse hockey team for it? No, not at all. To your point, he's still playing at a Selkie caliber, but I am not going to hold my breath that he's going to be reliable come next April. If they make the playoffs, because every, Every single year he's hurt and he's banged up. And that's not that's not a, a knock on him. It's the nature of the sport that he plays and how long he's been doing it. Patrice Bergeron has been playing for the Boston Bruins since Aaron Boone had a walk-off home run against Tim Wakefield back in 2003. Okay, the guy's been playing for a long time. And I think that to expect him to be healthy over the course of 82 going forward and playoffs, it's just this guy was playing through punctured lungs a decade ago. Okay, like it's just it's just not realistic. Now, like I said, of course I would take him back in a heartbeat if he if he were decide to come back to Boston. What I'm all I'm trying to say is like, don't get your hopes up and don't try to rely on Bergeron and Krejci because it's just it's just what we just saw. They 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 went they have the most record uh, most points in the in the season of all time the most the most wins the most points. Bergeron plays at a Selkie caliber. He'll probably win the Selkie again, and then he gets to the playoffs and shit just happens and and it's and when you've been doing it for 20 years like he has been at this level it's more it's 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 more likely that it can happen now here's my question scott this is where else i wanted to go with this my question to the boston bruins is why is it that the two best games you played in this series patrice bergeron and david Krejci, weren't in the lineup can you answer to me gentlemen why those are your best games, your most complete games, your most responsible games. I can tell you why it's not. It's not because you were better on paper or you're a better team without those guys. That's not true. You're not a better hockey team without Patrice Burrs running your number one center and Charlie Coyle filling in. That's not true. So why 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 was that your best hockey of the series? Answer that for me. Was it because you guys need, you knew you needed to step up? It, 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 is it a subconscious going to another level? When you know you have to, because you have to, because as a from a, to a man, you have to step up for your teammates. 
and then when they come back into the lineup, you kind of regress back into your your role and you and you, and you lose that fire. If that's the reason, it's inexcusable. Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit of all that. I, I think games three and four, they also and and they said that like they could identify this. Multiple players said we simplified more in that in those two games. I, I think that's I think one, that's a response to playing so poorly in game two. And two, it's a response to having those guys out and being like, okay. We're not going to do this with hero hockey. We're going to do it just coming together as a team and keeping things simple. And and I think they did that in games three and four. And then I don't know if it's because Bergeron comes back or they're back on home ice and they're trying to do too much. Like, I don't know, but they obviously got away from that. Like we didn't games five through seven. They just didn't play the same way they did in games three and four. Um, So, yeah, I think there is an element of, uh, you know, I think B- Bill Simmons decades ago coined the Ewing theory, um, which referenced how the New York Knicks in the 90s always were inexplicably better when Patrick Ewing was out injured. And I, I think you see that come up in sports. And like this could have been one of those cases where, yeah, guys just kind of band together when their top guy, or in this case, two of their top guys are out and they just sort of rally and for whatever reason once those guys came back they weren't able to to do that so i don't think there's a mental component but i also think there's the just the on ice of like they they played simple hockey and they didn't make those mistakes that were so costly in really all four of their losses in the series and i don't like i i i don't know why they got away from that like i Patrice Bergeron coming back in the lineup shouldn't affect like decisions you're making on the breakout. It's like what, like I, it shouldn't, you know. So it's like- Scott. You know what's you know what's crazy. Not to interrupt you, but like the conversation that you and I had along with Bridget and like everybody, right after Game Four, when the Bruins went up three to one, do you remember what we were saying? We were saying, <laughs> we were saying no. If Patrice Bergeron's willing to play and healthy enough to play. You play him in game five because you don't want to flirt with giving team life. You want to ice your best team and you want to step on the snake's throat and you want to end this series right now. Don't because just because you've won without Bergeron and Krejci in games three and four and the team locked things down without them doesn't mean they're going to be like better off by not having Bergeron and Krejci come back because people were saying, well, the Bruins took that three, one lead without Bergeron and Krejci just, they have a good thing going. Don't mess with the winning lineup. Let those guys continue to heal and and win the series. But, of course, when you're talking about Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci, you're going to say, I understand what you're saying. I respect that opinion. But you don't – you need Bergeron and Krejci to be in this lineup to ice your best team. And to think that if the Bruins didn't put Bergeron and Krejci back into the lineup in games – through seven at different times maybe they would have won this series scott and that that's honestly that's fair to say or at least question it's it's fair to question if the bruins win game five if they just ice the same lineup it's it's revisionist history it's stupid to even pose the question i know it's just it's it's mind-boggling to me that they did enter the lineup and the team actually played worse not because of bergeron's fault or creature's fault but because of their teammates just not playing with the same um attention to detail effort, desperation, you call it whatever you want with them back in the lineup. So I'm not blaming Bergeron and Krejci coming back themselves. I'm saying it's just it's 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 it just makes you feel like man, you just never know in sports because we were all saying the same thing. Don't 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 mess around. Finish it in five. Bergeron's good, put him in. Of course put him in. So it's just like insane to think about. Yeah, and it's also fair to question, you know, do they win the series if they rest all mark for a game at some point and go to Swayman. Like, you know, do they let all mark wear down and stick with him too long? We know he was dealing with something and maybe we'll find out more details on breakup day. Maybe we, we won't, but uh, the all mark we saw in games five and six was not the all mark we saw all season. And it wasn't the all mark we saw in games three and four in Florida. So 
yeah, there's there's plenty of blame to go around on on the team in front of them and on coaching decisions and all that. But like, also, you know, you got to make saves and you can't give up. I don't care what the defense is doing. You can't give up 10 goals in two games. So, you know, that's like another easy second guess. And, you know, like you, you know, I was a proponent of just keeping the rotation going and I don't know if that would have worked. I I don't, I think it's fair to, to wonder, like, I I absolutely wonder that. Um, But at the very least, even if you weren't going to go strict rotation, which I get, it's it's very rare. It would go against history. But I, I did all along think that you should be willing to go to Swayman. Um, you know, you could have done it after game two when Elmark struggles. You could have done it up 3-1 coming back home for game five. At, at worst, I absolutely think you should have done it after game five for game six when Elmark struggles in game five and – I I understand, you know, their thinking obviously was, hey, Almark struggled in game two, bounced back, gave us two strong games. They were obviously expecting the same thing, but it didn't happen. So, you know, then you end up in this precarious situation for game seven where it's either you stick with an Almark who has now had two straight subpar games or you go to Swayman Cold and it's like, you know, they kind of backed themselves into that by – not playing Swayman at, at any other point during the series. So that was another, you know, if we're looking at like what changed once they were up three, one, like that's one of them. They just, they, they stuck with Elmark and basically in my eyes, he, he wore down. Like he mm. just wasn't the same goalie and might be physical, mental, some combination of the two, but you know, another for me, it was a first guess, but certainly a pretty easy second guess, but yeah, just uh, you know, I've seen a lot of things changed from yeah. from game four through those final three games, and that's one of them. The lineup changes, one of them. The turnovers, like, yeah, it's you know, it it, it all adds up, and and now now all they can do is the same thing as us is is try to figure out what went wrong and find some way to 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 move on. Way mm-hmm. way earlier than anyone expected. Yep. And and by the way, please spare us the comments of, oh, why are you giving Florida credit? Why you because t-? we're not a Florida Panthers podcast for Christ's sake. Like we, can, if you want us to do that off 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 camera, Scott and I will give you an hour and a half on what Florida did well. But we're talking about the Bruins here. So yes, yeah. Florida played great. There's a lot that they did well, but we're focusing on the Bruins because this is a Boston podcast. So just keep that in perspective when you hear us rambling about this stuff. Um. I will you know, just say one one thing on Florida. We already obviously t- talked about him, but yeah, we talked about him th- earlier. Th- this was a huge series for Matthew Kachuk, just mm. career wise, because we had talked about it before. I had brought up like he's a guy that you think just looking at his game would be a playoff performer. In Calgary, he really wasn't. Like he was just over half a point a game. He, I think I was no fifteen points, fifteen points in twenty seven career games. No deep playoff runs. Um, you know, th- this was huge. Like this, this was a star mm. series. He he took over and was was unstoppable the whole time. Like you know, we already yeah, very kind of covered it. But like Bruins didn't didn't have an answer for him. A lot of a lot of players, Scott, tend to have their best series against the Bruins. The Bruins tend to be the stepping stone yeah. in a lot of success stories for other teams. But yeah, I want to know part of Matthew Kachuk going to the series. I look, I I wanted I wanted the Sleepy Islanders. I wanted well, first I wanted Pittsburgh because that would have been a sweep or a five game series for Boston. Pittsburgh has doesn't have half the heart that this Florida team has, and they weren't nearly as physical and, 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 and did, they didn't have that lunch pill mentality that Florida has, but I wanted the, I wanted the Islanders. I had, I wasn't worried about them at all. Brock Nelson was not going to beat the Boston Bruins in a seven game series as, as the Florida's best player. Cause at the time, Matthew Barzell was like just coming back to the lineup. Bo Horvat was invisible. Anders Lee, like <laughs> I wanted the Islanders. I'd wanted nothing part of Florida and Matthew Kachuk was a big part of it. Radko Gudis was another big part of it. As funny as that sounds, I didn't want him leaning on Boston for seven games. And guess what? He did exactly or, what I thought he was going to do or sitting or yeah. sitting on them. Yeah. 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 But, but that's who he is. And like, I just, that's not who you want to play for seven games. And he did his job very well. Um, I know he's not a star, but, and I know earlier I said, your best player has got to be your best player as they do. But, but Radko Gudis is a big reason why at times, you know, 
but Boston forward just they just didn't have I don't know he makes you pay the price but uh quickly on Allmark I I certainly wanted him out of the net after game 5 yes because of the overtime blunder and I think that some mistakes are big enough to warrant somebody having to you know pay the price for it tangibly Furthermore, though, he was laboring a lot in that game. There, I saw like there was there was a save he made or a goal he let up, and it was like a whistle. And he's just like he's leaning, he's leaning, and it's like this guy just he's he's going through something. So if Swayman's healthier, play Swayman. Um, but I have zero zero questions or regrets about them starting Swayman in Game Seven. And I'll tell you why. We talked about the Montour goal. Not being great. I told you before the podcast, I hated Charlie McAvoy's decision on that play to attack the guy with the puck on the boards who was not a scoring threat. He just overcommitted and and left Montour right in his lane to go down and take that shot. Now, the shot itself, yes, sneaky backhander, five-hole, not great. But Allmark in that game, if Allmark played in Game 7 the way he looked in Games 5 and 6, Boston could have lost Game 7 5 nothing. Don't forget, Florida was up 2 0 in that game. The second goal was not on Swayman. That's a sh- that was a complete breakdown in coverage and, and a turnover and whatnot. And that was a top shelf goal. The Bruins played like garbage in the first 40 minutes of game seven. Garbage. Their power plays were terrible. They and I'm talking their best players. They were they were they were passing the puck 10 feet in front of their target. They were whiffing on passes, whiffing on shots. The crowd was booing them multiple times before that third period happened. If it wasn't for Jeremy Swayman, Boston could have been down 4 5 nothing going into the third period. So if Linus Olmark is in that, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, they would have won. Because I guarantee you, he would have had a tough time keeping that game 2 nothing as well. So I don't think the Brewers have any doubt or revisionist history about putting in Swayman in Game 7. I think it was the right choice. Boston, like I said, Boston had a one goal lead in the final minute of the game. And that's after playing great hockey for 20 minutes. They played great in the third period. They did. They had one good shift in the first period, five on five, after a penalty kill, where they were, the Bruins were buzzing. Forty the first first 40 minutes were terrible. And and Scott, my question to you is this. Why? Why are the Bruins so not ready to play a game seven. Like this is why all the people who doubt the Bruins and don't trust them will sit there and say that like they they need to see the Bruins hoist the cup before they believe it. Because what team plays game seven at home and plays that tight and that careless for 40 minutes after already coughing up a three, one series lead after already losing twice on home ice in the series the Bru- Bruins fans deserve much better than what than what they saw in those forty minutes. And the Bruins, it's like if you're gonna if you're gonna lose, it's not just that the Bruins lose, Scott. It's that they find new ways to just totally break the hearts of their fan base. For the Bruins to win a cup this year would have been very difficult. I know they won sixty five games and they were the best regular season team of all time. Anybody who knows the game of hockey would say, "Great, that's the regular season." The Bruins need to play the best hockey of their season to win a Stanley Cup. What I'm saying is, I I like the Bruins' chances clearly better than anybody else's to win the Stanley Cup, but I didn't take the Bruins against the field. Like I figure that there's a good chance that at some point this spring, the Bruins might bow out of the Stanley Cup playoffs. But to do it in the first round after having multiple third period leads and closeout games, after having a 3-1 series lead, after going down 2 nothing, coming back to go up 3-2 midway through the third period, to have your crowd on their feet as loud as they were, as supportive as they were, and then you give up a goal in the final minute of a game, and then you lose in overtime. They just find ways to break the hearts of this fan base, and the Bruins fan base is phenomenal. Like, they really are. Scott, it's very fair to label this Bruins team. 2019 was bad. 2013, the Blackhawks were a great team. Yes, it was a collapse. But the Blackhawks were really, really good. The Blues, on paper, were not better than that Boston Bruins team. The Bruins should have won that series. They no-showed Game 7. That was bad. That was a big black mark on this Bruins era. 
this it's it's right up there with 2019. You can make the argument it's worse. The stakes weren't as high because it was game seven of the cup finals against the blues, but this collapse, the way they did it, it's fair to sit here and say now, especially when the Bruins have nobody to blame but themselves. You can't blame the refs. You can't blame any circumstances. The Bruins got outplayed. This Bruins team, Bergeron's a great player. Martian's a great player. This Bruins era, it is very fair to say that they just don't know how to win when it matters most. And and that's a totally fair criticism. And there's nothing else we can really say at this point. Their their actions are what drive our words. And and they they fall they fall short. They just always fall short. And it's not 1970 or 1980s or late 70s, too many men in the ice Montreal forum type shit. This is like, no, you got outplayed. You got outplayed. No excuses. Yeah. So I have plenty of saying that, but just before I forget, circling back to playing Swayman in Game Seven, I'm with you. Like I, I don't regret that. I don't think it was the wrong call. I don't second guess it. And since Bridget is is unable to join us, uh, she had a tweet last night that like kind of perfectly highlighted one one of the things that Swayman brought, which was he was tying up shots that Allmark wasn't in the previous two games. That the Panthers had traffic around them. They had you know, chances through traffic deflections and Swayman was killing them. He was just gobbling them up and getting the whistle. And we saw those kind of plays get scrambly with all Mark and Ned in games five and six. So good observation from Bridget and highlighted uh, one of the key differences. And, and like you said, one of the reasons why I don't second guess it and think, you know, they made the right call. And I do think it potentially wouldn't have even been that close to Falmark had started. Certainly Falmark had started and looked the way he had in the previous couple games. Um so on like this group's legacy and not being able to win since 2011. Uh you know and look that really like that group's gone. We're just talking about Bergeron, Marsha and Krejci that are left and it's thank God for all those guys that they had 2011. Because otherwise, like their legacy really takes a hit. Then, then they're they're basically all the, the same guys who were here in like the '80s and '90s, who had some good teams, were in the playoffs pretty much every year, but but never won. And um, so they at least did that. So that's good. And like they all have their places in in Bruins franchise history, right? Like as disappointing as this is, as disappointing as 2019 as is when the day comes for Bergeron's 37 to go to the rafters and Martian's 63 and Krejci's 46 place is going to be rocking. It's going to be on its feet. Those guys are going to be loved here forever, but yeah, it's also absolutely going to be part of their legacies that, that they left one, maybe two on the table. And you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to look at this year. Like, are we going to look at this as one that got left on the table because they lost in the first round? So like, I know the regular season was incredible, but it's kind of hard to say they left a cup on the table when they would have needed to win three more rounds after this. Like they went out early 2019. Yeah. They absolutely left on the table. That's one they should have won. Um, they should have at least won this round though. That's, that's going to be there forever. Like, like you said, like there's, no one is ever even close to guaranteed to win the cup. So the idea that like, Oh, this Bruins team should have won the cup. It's like, I guess, but man, like the Stanley cup playoffs are, are really tough. And if you had lost and honestly, like if you had lost in seven, even to this Leafs team, which I think is really good. And by the way, is now the betting favorite to win the cup. Um, you know, I, I know people like some of the lazier hockey analysts around here would have said like, Oh, you lost to Toronto, the team that could never win a series that you always dominated. I would have looked at and been like, this isn't your older brother's Toronto Maple Leafs. Like, this is a really good team. If you had lost to a loaded Rangers team or even like the Devils or Carolina Conference Friends, I think those are all really good teams. If you lost a cup final to, I don't, to Connor McDavid's Oilers and like McDavid just goes off and has 15 points in seven games, like, you know, stuff like that. It's like, 
yeah, like nothing's given, but they should have gone out of the first round, though. Like at the very least. Yeah. Yeah, this Panthers team was better than a typical eight seed. They did win the President's Trophy last year. You're still better. You, you still should have uh-huh. beat them. You you are up three one. You had three third period leads in game six and seven, and you blew it. And that's you can give all the credit in the world to the Panthers, and they deserve it. But ultimately, that's how this Bruins team is gonna gonna be remembered. They're gonna be remembered for owning every regular season record, and then choking away a, a three, one series lead and giving up the tying goal in game seven in the final minute. Like that's, yeah. I mean, and that's, that, that's, that, that's hard that's, to shake that but, you don't, you don't get to erase that from your resume. That's exactly it. Scott. It's, it's not just the first round. It's how they lost. You're up three, one in the series. You're up multiple times in game six and you're up in game seven, but like, you're right. The, the term cup or bust was very, very common with this team going into the playoffs. Okay. So to sit there and say that they lost a cup or they, or they let a cup slip through their fingers, uh, three rounds, four rounds early is, is, is it's not, it's, 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 it's a tough sell. Right. But what I will say is the Bruins, this Bruins team, did exactly the only they did the only thing you couldn't do. You couldn't lose in the first round. If you lose in the second round, like you said, or the conference finals or the cup finals, is it a disappointment? Of course. Of course it's a disappointment. Okay? Anytime you don't achieve your goal, it's a disappointment, especially when you've had the season that the Bruins had. Okay. But fans would have been able to stomach easier losing to Toronto in seven, say, right. Or losing to the Rangers, the devils or the hurricanes in a tightly fought series and shit happens or losing to the Oilers or the stars and something just went awry and hockey's tough, man. Or, or guys, guys get injured, right? Like maybe Bergeron and Krejci re-aggravate stuff and, and they're done for the playoffs. Well, apparently, like, apparently they would have won a cup, Scott, if they, if they didn't <laughs> right, play. So well, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, But look that what, what fans, what fans can't stomach would be the only thing that the Bruins couldn't do. And it's what they did. Not only did they lose in the first round, they lost up three, one, with multiple chances to close out a series. When Brad Marshan missed that breakaway in the last second of game five to win the series, I had a bad feeling right then and there. I For that Bruins team to hop on a plane when that could have been the series. And then, of course, they had a chance to win overtime and they lost. But to go back to Florida after that game and play a Panthers team with all new life in them, I was not. I was very, very trepidatious about that. And then, of course, you know, after the Game 6 podcast or game, our podcast, I may have let on a little bit more optimistic than, than I truly was feeling. But I, I knew where you – I knew where you – what you were feeling, what Bridget was feeling. And I just didn't want to have all three of us being like, I don't feel good about this game. I was I was being optimistic, but I was probably faking it a little bit because I was nervous as shit going into that game last night. Because we've seen it all it, – it's all we've seen from the Bruins. They find ways to lose outside of 2011. But look at the year before that. Like, Scott, you know what's crazy? Look at all the 3-1 series leads. This Bruins, this Bergeron era, and I'm not blaming Bergeron, but, like, that that they've had. The Bruins, dating back to when Razor was playing, which is a long time ago, 3-1. Okay, but Bergeron was on the team. That's why I'm bringing it up. So the Canadians back in 04, but put that off to the side. That was, that's, that's, Bergeron was a rookie. I'm not talking about that shit. Um, You, you, you blow a 3-1, a 3-0 lead to Carolina. Oh no, I'm sorry. You were down 3-1 in that series. Okay. You blow a 3-0 lead to Florida. Um yeah, Florida. What what Phil, are they called? Philly. Philly, Philly in 2010, okay? Obviously a 3-1 lead's part of that. Uh they blew a 3-1 lead to the uh Maple Leafs not once but twice along their three series wins over Toronto. And then you do it to um Florida this year and I might be forgetting another one, but 
man, not no no lead is safe with this Bruins team over the last 20, 15 years. They've don't get me wrong, they've closed out a lot of series. I mean, the Bruins, along with like the Kings and the Penguins and the Lightning, the Bruins are probably a top five team in the league over the last twenty years with with playoff round victories. I don't know, man. Like they they did they did the one thing that they couldn't do when I was losing the first round, and they they picked the most gut wrenching way to do it to their fan base. Yeah, they they've played a lot of playoff series, so like just by that, you're bound to kind of have every experience and sort of run the spectrum. And this group in particular has found it through either not being able to close out series or at times. Uh, forcing game sevens when they've been down three, two in series, they've played a lot of game sevens. Uh, last night was Bergeron's 14th game seven, which is tied with Zidane Char for the most ever. And obviously, uh, you know, 12 of Chara's 14 game sevens came with the Bruins two came with Ottawa. Um, so they've been in the situation a lot and we know, obviously they've had some huge game seven wins that they, they won three of them in 2011. They beat the Maple Leafs in Game 7s in 2013, 18, and 19. But, man, have they also had their share of just absolute heartbreak. Uh, you know, obviously this and, and 2019 Cup Final most prominently, but, you know, Washington with Joel Ward. Um, you Scott know, Walker. Montreal. Yeah. Scott Walker in Game 7. And that team, that team, Scott, was like a – that was a juggernaut Bruins team. They – they, if yeah. they got through the Carolina, like they could have gone to the finals that year. Yeah, the Montreal loss in there, like so. You know, I mean, now in the Bergeron era, they're they're six and eight in Game Seven. So you'd you'd love to be on the winning side of that, but you know, especially because like a lot of those have been at home. Like that's that's a tough pill to swallow is losing Game Sevens on on home ice. Um, and three were in one year. The yeah, three the run, right? Yeah, three of the wins. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's it's fascinating. Like, I, I unfortunately this this group, this core is, if this really is the end for for Bergeron and Krejci, like we're all gonna feel forever that they should have had at least one more, maybe two, and um, you know, that's. That's tough because it, you get that second one, and then like you're in the same group as the '70s Bruins that that won too. And like, yeah, people look back on that team and say they should have won more, and they absolutely should have. But two Stanley Cups, nothing to sneeze at. Like that's still that's still a pretty great place to be. One, and then going, you know, twelve years of coming up short. Like that's that's tougher. Would have been great if they had found a way to cap off their careers with one more and all season long, they had a team that looked like it was absolutely capable of doing it. And and I still think they were, I still think this team was absolutely good enough to win a Stanley cup. I, you know, people call them like a, a paper tiger or, Oh, they just weren't as good as their record. And I don't, maybe there's some truth to that. Like, it, but again, I think something swung that, uh, you know, it's interesting. Like, if you dive into the analytics, because a couple people tweeted this, like, if you look at like expected goal differential during the regular season, the Bruins and Panthers were actually pretty close. And the biggest difference, well, there are a couple, but the Bruins had historically great goaltending that re- really throws expected goals out of whack because your goals are stopping way more than they're expected to. And the Panthers had below average goaltending and really poor finishing during the regular season. So like you can look at that and be like, Oh, well, I guess they actually were pretty even if you look at that and like, Hey, that's a win for expected goals, right? Like they expected goals can take a victory lap today, but it's like, well, who would have predicted that the Bruins goaltending would go eight eighty five in a seven game series? Like what did we see this season that would have told us that the Bruins weren't just going to, not only were they, would they not get great goaltending in the series? but they would get like legitimately bad goaltending for a good chunk of the series. Like that's, you know, I would have thought you were crazy if you said that. So it's tough. It's, you know, a lot, a lot went against them. And now like they, they have to deal with this. This is, you know, 
if this is the end, then it ends in, in massive disappointment. And that's, that's going to be part of their legacy. Do you think there's a happy medium Jim Montgomery can find defensively? Because look, I it, it's, it's, it's so cheap. It's such a cheap shot for me to sit here after a 65 win season, all those NHL records broken, getting the best out of so many players that we didn't even see a ce- potential ceiling for on this team, like Fred, Fred, Trent Frederick and Nick Felino and, just other players up and down this Bruins lineup that seem to really benefit from Jim Montgomery's presence and coaching style. And, and look, if the Bruins were to get through Florida, I, I, that's the interesting thing about this team. Like they, they played so poorly for their, for their standard for most of the series and they still almost won a series. And if they did win the series, like, yeah, I could have totally seen them button things up. And yeah, you mentioned like Bergeron probably would have had a more lingering issue going on with his back and create you. So you never know. But I did think the Bruins would like, yeah, they, the sky was the limit if they won that series. Um, but you know what's interesting, Scott? All of these turnovers, all of these careless plays. I'm not trying to take a cheap shot here, and this is this is probably going to be a big talking point, and it's, it's it's a cheap talking point. I get it, but we didn't see that with under 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 Bruce Cassidy's system. They were like not nearly to that degree and I guess I'm not saying Jim Montgomery wasn't the right guy for this team what I'm saying is did you see anything structurally X's and O's wise that the Bruins just played allowing their D to activate so much and it just kind of over the course of the season that their their, their D just got used to making plays with the puck on their stick and then they just started overthinking whereas like you think back to like meat and potatoes defenses it's just, like look at Radko Gudis and look look at the defensive core that just beat you okay Radko Gudis Mark Stahl um you know Montour is like a new age defenseman but Gudis Mark Stahl like those are those are old school defensemen that they they aren't overthinking anything I got puck on stick I get rid of puck on stick like they're not like I'm not saying this as like a compliment to necessarily, but like you have to simplify the game in the playoffs. And I'm wondering if all the bells and whistles of an offensively and creativity creatively flowed system in the regular season, I'm wondering if it just led to overthinking in the playoffs. And yeah, so if, I, yeah, it's, did it's, you hear that last part, Scott? You just kind of yeah went away for a second. It's it, it's a fair question. I I think. Um... I don't know that it like I don't think the the system was wrong or anything. I think I think what Jim Montgomery built this year with the defense activating more and being more involved in the offense was huge because I think it helped them create more five on five offense and it helped them create more high danger chances, which were huge points of emphasis coming off the last couple of years and were areas they needed to improve and did over the course of the year. Where I would question is okay, when you're not getting as smooth of breakouts and transitions from your own zone, you know, did he, did he wait too long to simplify and tell guys, look, we're going to have to resort to more, just, you know, put it off the glass and out, uh, flip it out into the neutral zone and, and go battle 50, 50, um, you know, so, so was that adjustment too slow? Did they need more of that? Because, I, I would rather have a defense core that can be more mobile and, and and do more and then have to reel it in and simplify if if needed versus, you know, look, Florida obviously won this series, so great, it worked for them. But I think if you if you go the other way where all you can do is keep it simple and then you get into a, to a series where you need your defense to be more active and carry the puck more because that's what they're and you can't do it. Like that's tougher to, to adjust to mid series. So, you know, Jim Montgomery was asked after game seven, like, do you think you had the personnel or, or was it execution? And he basically just said like, I, you know, I need more time to think about it, but right now I would, you know, I put it on myself, like, I, you know, we, we didn't adjust the right way. And I kind of, my thought as we sit here the morning after is, that's what I think it is. Like, I, I don't think it was a personnel issue. I think this defense core had, had everything you needed, honestly. Like, I think you're getting very nitpicky if you're like, oh, we need a better defense core than one that has McAvoy, Lindholm, Orlov, Carlo, 
Grizz, like Forber, Clinton, like that should be a good enough defense score to do whatever it is you want to do. And and I'll absolutely second guess like taking Grizz like out, putting Clifton back in. But overall, like that, it, to me, it's I, I just think they were too slow to adjust. And when when the the smooth transitions that they're used to weren't going to be there, I do think there wasn't enough simplifying, and it didn't happen quick enough. And they still tried to. They still resorted to trying, trying the plays that you know were there a lot of the season. But again, they were there in, during the season when you weren't facing a team that was one of the best four check teams in the league. Like that's that's a team that presents problems and forces you to adjust your breakout. And at times they they didn't make those adjustments in nearly a timely enough manner. I want to ask you a question about somebody in particular who's. Pound for pound, one of my favorite players I've ever watched in the Bruins, and that's Charlie McAvoy. Now, a lot of people were commenting to me last night after uh, a post-game tweet, and just I saw chatter about this in general. A, a lot of people are expecting more of McAvoy, and when they don't see it in the playoffs consistently enough, they are questioning – if he, I don't know, they're just questioning his his level of play in the playoffs. Now, here, here's the thing. Charlie McAvoy's first NHL shift was in the middle of a playoff series back in 2017 against the Ottawa Senators, a team that was one goal away in double overtime from going to the cup finals that year. McAvoy stepped in, played far beyond his years, and was just such a stud. And you could just see what this kid could be and what he was going to be. The following year, the Bruins beat the the Maple Leafs in Game 7, and then they lost the Lightning in Game 5. Um, I thought McAvoy played well in that Lightning series. He had a goal. He, 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 that Lightning team was really good. Fine. 2019, he and Char led the Bruins to a cup run. I think Charlie McAvoy played great in that cup run. But since the 2019 finals, how would you assess his postseason play as a whole? We're now talking, we're talking the bubble year where they beat Carolina in five, bowed out to Tampa in five, but that was a really weird situation. Then they lost to the Islanders in six. He got kind of bullied in that series. And last year they lost to the Hurricanes in seven. He was good, wasn't awesome, I don't think, at times. And then this year. So I guess what I'm asking you, Scott, is is it fair to say over the last three or four postseasons that Charlie McAvoy has not really been the guy that he they need him to be and that he's been for them every regular season that he's played? Yeah, I think, you know, look, he's a player who finished top five in Norris voting two years in a row before this year. This year, I think if he had played a full season, he might finish top five again. Um, So I think it's fair to say like you haven't quite seen that level of defenseman in the playoffs the last few years. I, I definitely don't think he's been bad. And I thought there are times in this series that he was great. Like we talked about him setting the physical tone. And I think, I think that helps get him into the game um, when he does that. Like, he he sets a physical tone without taking himself out of the play, and I think it, it kind of elevates his, his all-around game. And even Game 7, I thought he had some really good offensive zone shifts, but overall I don't think we saw enough of those in this series. Um, and, you know, the, the tough thing is, is like in the past I think we've looked at the, the Grizzly-McAvoy pairing hasn't been as good and hasn't been nearly as good in the playoffs as they are in the regular season. And before this year, it was like almost a complete reversal. It was like, you know, if you looked at like course, expected goals, all that, it was like that pairing would, would be over 60% in the regular season, like under 40% in the playoffs. Like it was like a complete reversal. And I think, you know, we would look at that and go, well, Grizzly doesn't hold up in the playoffs. And you would kind of pinpoint that as the problem. What's tough for McAvoy is this year he got a lot of time with Orlov, who, you know, should be a better playoff defenseman, better playoff partner than Grizzlick is. And that pairing still 
struggled. And it's like, I don't, you know, they got a lot of time together in the regular season. I think they learned each other's games, but, you know, was something missing there? Is there a reason that Orlov McAvoy as a pairing didn't click? You know, is that McAvoy's fault? You know, are they both at fault? Is it Orlov? Is it Matt? Like, I I would probably need to like try to dive into it more, but it's for whatever reason it doesn't it, it hasn't clicked and for it to now not work with you know a different D partner than what he's had in the past, sort of yeah, you do look at McAvoy a little more and be like, all right, what's what's his role in this? Like he's a player who should be able to perform with basically anyone. So why isn't it quite working at elite Norris trophy caliber levels in the playoffs. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, but like, I wonder, like, I know it's tough to break up Lindholm Carlo because of how good they were in the regular season. But I do wonder, like if you went to Lindholm McAvoy on a more regular basis, like would that, would that have been it? Maybe that would have gotten both of them going more, you know, at, I don't know. Again, it's so easy to second guess after something like this, but um, you know, I wonder if maybe that's something we see more of going forward. Where, hey, th- these guys are both here for for eight years. You know what? Seven more after this. You know, is it worth seeing if like if the best thing for both of those guys is to play together? Like, I think that's probably something worth exploring going forward. Um, so yeah, it's it's fair to be critical to an extent of McAvoy. I I, I don't think he's been bad, so like I'm not going to go that far. But he can't but, be bad, Scott. He's he's too good to be bad. Right. So the question is yeah. more like, why isn't the, he getting quite all the way to top gear? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I don't have a great answer, but it it is fair to say like he hasn't quite gotten there. Yeah, and and you know you watch this team. Look, Scott. Now that it's now that it's over and done with, and we're not recapping every game and trying to find the positives and whatever, but like the, the Bruins didn't play great hockey the last month and a half of the season. Even games that they won, the lineup was inconsistent for different reasons: injuries, trade deadlines, cap reasons, whatever. But the line, the lineup was inconsistent. Their play was inconsistent, and so when I said off the top of the podcast that the Bruins weren't playing the meaningful games that Florida was playing. And I guess all I was saying, bringing it up for was because I just, am I surprised they lost the series? Yes. Am I surprised that their, that their inconsistent play carried over into the first round? No, I wasn't surprised by that. I just thought that it would be still good enough to win a series against Florida. I'm not surprised that their poor play inconsistent play. I'll say carried into the first round. Um, and I, I think a lot has to do with that. Yeah, tinkering with D pairs, always finding a different guy to play with a different guy, different forward lines. Like you can't, you can't just stick your hands into a a, a, tr- a trick or treating bag and just shove all the candy. Pick your favorite candy and just stick with it. All right. Like Jim Montgomery was just—he was a kid in the candy store too much with the, with these lines and 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 D pairs. And I know a lot of it was injury reasons, and I know a lot of it was cap reasons. And I get it, but there were times down the stretch here and in the playoffs where he had his total arsenal. And he just still just – he couldn't help himself. He just had to keep just changing things up and changing things up and see what works and see what sticks. And this guy was feeling bad with this guy, so I want to put it with this guy so they could laugh together. It's like just put your – put the lines together that you had for most of the season and run with it. Like the, the Bruins – game seven, the Bruins – I think you made this point earlier. It's like they didn't even run off the lines that they had most of the year. Like Bergeron, Bertuzzi, and Martian had how many games together? Not in the regular season, right? It was all in the series. I think they did one. I think they had one together in the regular season where they yeah. moved Bertuzzi up there, just like during that initial kind of two week trial run where they were moving them all around. But just crazy, yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's weird because like we kept talking about what's what's this, uh, you know, mythical full lineup. Like, are we ever actually going to see them healthy? And it's like you actually finally got it in game six and seven, but as a result, it was like, you almost had one too many forwards. Like, like no matter what, someone was going to be somewhere where it was something different. And, you know, so it's like, okay, you can say, put Marsha and Bergeron and DeBrus together, check line together. All right. So now that third lines, Hall, Coyle, Bertuzzi, 
which hasn't been together. And Montgomery clearly didn't have a lot of faith in. Like he went, he started game six with them together and went away from it about halfway through that game. Um, and it's like, well, the natural fit there, the guy who was on that line all year and played pretty damn well there was Trent Frederick. But it's like, okay, well, so Tyler Bertuzzi's going down to the third to the fourth line. He's like tied for your team lead in points in the playoffs. He's he's playing on the fourth line. You know, so it's we kept saying like it was a great problem to have, and it was. And you know, Don Sweeney did a great job adding to this team at the trade deadline. But because you never had everyone healthy, you never you never got you never found that lineup that you know, how does it look best with with everyone in it? And they you try to figure it out on the fly in the middle of a playoff series. And like, that's, that's tough to do. And I don't even know what, I don't even know what the right answer is. Like, I don't know who, who you, you know, my approach would have been the same thing that they did. Like to me, it's, it's Frederick or Felino is, is a healthy scratch and, and too bad. And I think if it had gone another game, might've been Hathaway who was a healthy scratch in the next game after, you know, I thought he had a pretty tough game seven, but you know, it's like, I can sit here and say, like, I want Frederick with Coyle because that combination has worked all year. But then who's going down to the fourth line or coming out of the lineup from that top nine? Like, it's it, – they just were never able to to really practice it all and, and settle on anything. And I guess the one second guess I would have there is why – those last three regular season games when Hall returns, why didn't – he try Hall Coyle Bertuzzi for a full game or two. Like just knowing that at some point that might be your third line in the playoffs. Like why didn't that get more of a look? So that's, that's something I still question, but you know, otherwise it's, it's trying to fit a lot of good pieces together and not quite finding uh, the right combination. Um. And I've I've now lost Brian, which I think is is a sign that maybe it's time to to wrap up this podcast. So uh, I think we've we've covered pretty much everything. We will be doing another episode um, after we'll be doing another episode after like breakup day and and press conferences for Don Sweeney and Cam Neely, and we'll do some looking ahead to the off season then, and you know what what changes they're going to make, what this team will look like next year. Um, I, on behalf of all of us, I definitely want to thank everyone who's, who's listened all season. We will continue to go throughout the off season, maybe not quite as frequently, but uh, we really appreciate everyone listening and everyone watching, uh, getting the podcast up on YouTube more has, uh, I think been really good for us. And, you know, has been, um, you know, has been a, a positive experience and uh, I think has added another way for people to interact with us. So we appreciate it. We appreciate you listening, all the support, and uh, we'll talk to you again later this week.